Welcome to session four. Let's make a start. So today we're going to be talking about comparing machine learning and organizational learning. That's kind of the, the theoretical uh, highlight of, of what we talk about. The pictures you see here are all examples of situations where multi-agent reinforcement learning has been very effective. Right? It's actually taken from one of the papers that we had to read for today, the review paper. So on the left, you have uh, autonomous vehicles, unmanned autonomous vehicles, drones, if you like. Uh, then you have a picture of Go, right, which is the famous Asian game of uh, strategy. You have a game of poker, and then you have multiplayer online uh, video gaming. And each of these have been test cases where multi-agent reinforcement learning has been extremely effective. And in a lot of these circumstances, particularly, I think, examples one and four, it's kind of like, you know, they really are studying organizational learning in very similar ways to the way we are. Okay, there are multiple agents, there are interdependencies, there are influence structures, and we'll talk about these in more detail. But obviously, they're coming at it from slightly different starting points. But the main objective for today's session really is to show you that these similarities exist. They're very strong. And uh, for sure, these guys are tackling these problems with a different set of tools and with a lot more technical sophistication, I think, than we are. But there's a lot I think we can learn from them. And maybe there's a little that we can also teach them about how to conceptualize, uh, how to think about organization learning, right? So that's really the objective of today's session to highlight the similarities and differences between uh, learning by machines versus organization learning. So we'll begin by wrapping up a few open questions from session three. And then we'll talk a little bit about some core ideas in the topic for today. So quick overview of machine learning. Uh, I'm assuming at this stage in NCIH program, all of you have at least like some basic familiarity with what machine learning is all about, different kinds of machine learning. Uh, we'll revisit very quickly the bias variance trade-off, which again, I'm assuming you should be aware of, but if not, then we'll make sure you are. And then we'll jump into multi-agent reinforcement learning, in particular, the two papers that we uh, assigned for discussion for today. They're kind of set almost 15 years apart. So one was in 2005, one came out in 2019. And in part, I think I wanted to show you both because um, it also gives you a sense of progress in the field. Okay, And if you look at how their own thinking in, machine, in computer science has evolved over time, uh, starting with these essentially cooperative multi-actor learning problems to the more general version of the problem, which is nowadays called MARL, multi-agent reinforcement learning. And uh, the second paper is very technical, so I asked you to only skim it. But hopefully that skim already showed you that they're really dealing with the same sort of issues we are, right? Pretty much everything that we talked about in the last three sessions is central in this paper as well. Uh, they're using sometimes different vocabulary, different tools to get at it, but it's really the same thing. So we are tackling really a very general class of problems here. And that's why I think it's useful to, to at least be aware of what our friends are doing. And then we may have some things to learn. We may have some things to teach, but that comes later. So that's roughly the first half of today's session. The second half, I want to focus really on hearing from you guys now. So uh, hopefully you would have completed your application projects and send them to us that we'll review and get back to you offline. But in class, what we want to focus on are your thoughts on research opportunities. Okay, so the, this, the, the recording will stop at the first half of today's class. I think the second half for your research opportunities, they are your private information and private property. So they remain off the record. But I think it's a good opportunity to discuss collectively now that we all have a common language and a common frame of reference. We can help each other better in sharpening the questions, right? So what we want to do is try and come up with, by the end of that discussion, at least a few ideas about what else remains to be understood about organizational learning broadly, and which among those questions are actually suitable for tackling with the formal tools that we have developed. Okay, whether it's single agent learning or dyadic learning or network, multi-agent reinforcement learning. But that's where I want to go in the second half of the class. And the way we want to do it is we'll do it by group. So I know we have uh, three groups in the class, right? So we're going to let each group kind of decide how they will combine and aggregate their individual presentations. Uh, I leave it entirely up to you. You could take the time that you have. Let's give each group about 15 minutes. And maybe one option is every group, every member presents. Up to you, 15 minutes is what you have. Or you kind of synthesize within the group and make a quick agreement on which two or three ideas you collectively think are the most interesting. 
So maybe you can do that during the break uh, or even you know, just send each other an email and coordinate. But I do want to at least get those ideas up on the board for collective scrutiny. And that's when we can close the class. All right. Any questions or uh, any additional suggestions for the agenda or are we good to go? Okay. So let me start by reminding you of something from last time. And then I'll also stop and see if you have further questions on topics from last time. So if you recall, we ended the discussion saying, when you go from individual to multi-actor learning, multi-agent learning, there are two broad ways you can do it, right? You can think about multiple actors who still take a single action in aggregate. That's a unified action model. An example would be a committee. So Henning's paper that we discussed last time is an example of that. So there are multiple actors, but collectively they take one action. Okay? And the other is what you might call a distributed action model, where every actor is taking an action that directly affects the task environment. So this would be more like the Kochak, Puranam, and Leventhal, Kochak, Leventhal, and Puranam paper, right? So that's a team model, a distributed action model. In the unified action models, such difficulty is obviously the main thing you would vary and study in the task environment. Coordination doesn't make any sense because of single action, right? On the other hand, the distributed action models can be used to study both problems of search difficulty and coordination. And depending on how important the coordination is, if it's not at all important, you get parallel search, otherwise you get coupled search. So this we discussed last time in some detail. I want to take a couple more minutes today to talk about the next two rows, uh, which is the distinction between the centralization or decentralization of decision rights and the structure of mutual influence among actors. Is it symmetric or asymmetric? Okay. And I want to point out that while these are different rows in this table, there's actually a deep connection between them. And the connection is as simply stated as follows. In the limit, maximal asymmetric influence is identical to centralization of decision rights. Okay, so I'll repeat the statement. So if you maximize asymmetric influence in a group, it's the same as the centralization of decision rights. So how do we get that? So think about it like this. Let's say there's a very small organization of two actors. Okay. So there's just two actors in this system. And when we think about centralization, we can think about centralization of decisions, or we can think about network centralization. So how is decision centralization usually defined? So in a group, if you have multiple actors, and the decision-making rights on behalf of the group are held by one actor, that's decision centralization, right? If every actor has a voice through a vote or through consensus or some other process like that, it's considered decentralized decision-making. So centralization versus decentralization of decision-making should be clear. There's also a construct called network centralization. And in fact, the standard way to measure that is Freeman's measure of network centralization. Anybody remembers how that is computed? So what does network centralization mean? So intuitively, if I were to draw two networks, let's say this is one and this is another. Which one is the most centralized network? This one? Yeah, why? Well, formally, the reason this is considered more centralized and the way we would measure the degree of centralization is we would first draw the distribution of degree of each of these actors. So in the picture here, this actor has a degree of five. Every other actor has a degree of one. So there's a huge asymmetry in the degree in this network, right? And the greater that asymmetry, the more we say the network is centralized. So this is the property captured by Freeman's network centralization measure. Okay. Whereas here, the degree for every actor is the same, it's five. So there is no asymmetry in the degree distribution, right? So this is the concept of network centralization. So how does network centralization relate to decision centralization? Okay. It's a very confusing thing because often people will use the word centralization without saying which one they mean. And as you can see, they don't necessarily mean the same thing. So to take an example, 
I can take this group where each of these ties is an influence tie. Okay, and even here, each of these ties is an influence tie. But I could choose to give the decision rights to decide on behalf of the group to one person, or I could have them vote. Okay, so if I have decided to have them vote, then this is still a decentralized decision structure, even though the influence structure is highly centralized. Conversely, I can have an influence structure which is highly decentralized. But in the end, I might say this guy makes the final call. That's the final decision. Okay, the discussion is one where everybody influences everybody else, but in the end, this, this fellow is the guy making the call. That's a highly centralized decision structure. So centralization of decision making and network centralization are not identical. At the same time, they are not orthogonal. The reason being there is a limit case where these two things become the same. Right? That's the interesting question. So the question is, when do they become identical? And I already gave you the answer. The answer is, if the influence of each actor on the other is 100%, right? And I can make that precise by using De Groot's formula. Remember De Groot's formula? De Groot's formula says the belief of actor B at time t is equal to the belief of actor B at time t minus 1 times some weight plus 1 minus w, the belief of actor A time t minus 1. Right, that's degrowth averaging. So in this model, if I put the entire weight on A, right, which is equal to saying W goes to zero, then it's as if you're saying B's beliefs are identical to A's beliefs. So B does not take their own belief into account at all when forming their belief. They literally are brainwashed by A. So when influence is so strong that it amounts to brainwashing, then network centralization and decision centralization are the same thing. Okay, that's the limit case. But when influence is not as strong, when influence is short of brainwashing, then the two things are not the same. And most often our influence structures are not equivalent to brainwashing. So that's why it's really important to distinguish whether we are talking about centralization of influence, which is the network topology question, or centralization of decision rights, which is the question of who gets to finally choose in a group. Is this clear, the distinction between the two? Yeah, okay, Piyush. Uh, so I think there's always another centralization when when we talk about in a very economic sense, right? That centralization of tasks uh, to, for uh, for like economies of scale. So that and then that's that would again be another independent dimension to all of this, right? So there's influence, so there's networks, there's decision rights. So there's influence, there's decision rights, and there's tasks. So it's, give me a bit more on the centralization of tasks idea. I'm not sure I fully get no. it. So as in, um, so so like functions that are horizontal rather than verticals. So as in very corporate strategy way of thinking that you would do certain things in a particular function rather than in different business units, because mm -hmm. uh, there is economies of scale of doing this together in the center rather than. Uh, right. So that's actually the one usage of centralization I don't find very precise about what they're really saying. The reason is the following. Suppose, let's say we centralize the functions in a large company. So I take all the HR or the accounting from the different divisions and move it into one, right? So effectively we're calling that centralization because we're saying we are bringing all similar functions together, okay? But conversely, if I were to put all these functions back into their divisions, then I could say I'm centralizing different functions together within the divisions. So what is the word centralization capturing here? Is, is it just a synonym for bringing together? If it's a synonym for bringing together, then we haven't specified bringing together what? Because even in a divisional structure, we are bringing together, but different functions, right? In a functional structure, we're bringing together similar functions. So all centralization along one dimension is also, is also decentralization along the other. So it's never very clear what people mean when they say we centralize functions, okay? So that's the one usage that I have not found to be particularly okay. precise. I think we can deal with that very easily by thinking of it as a problem of task allocation. Okay, so are we really doing task allocation by object or by activity or task division? Really? So that already captures it. I think we don't need in addition the language of centralization there. Okay. But but, if, so, so, but there's no, I'm not saying I'm tr trying to ban the usage of language. But okay, but I'm just saying if people say centralization, at a minimum we should ask them: Do they mean centralization of decision rights, network structure? Or are you telling me some story about grouping functions together versus not? 
Which one do you mean? Right? As long as we know that, we are okay. So, isn't just one quick follow up question? So, isn't like centralization of tasks then different from decisions and and influence, or or is it the same? So that's, that, that's what I mean by it's not precise when we talk about centralization of tasks. So, for instance, if you said the decisions on all accounting related activities throughout mm -hmm. the corporation are going to be made by one person. This is a centralization of decision rights. Mm -hmm. okay. right? Now, if you say, I'm going to bring all the accounting activity from different parts of the company to one mega department, then you're implying there is centralization of decision rights. But in addition, you're also implying some kind of special economies of scale or scope. Because I put them in one building, I get like lower rent per capita or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first usage is clear because it's centralization of decision rights. The second is not. Because just as you get economies of scale by putting these things together, you could also get economies of scope by putting them with other functions. Okay. I, said, I, I, said, I, I had a couple of things, but I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about it later okay. when I present my idea. But at a minimum, I think the, the, the main distinction that I want to draw between centralization of decisions and networks hopefully should be clear. And you can see that while they are orthogonal, they're not orthogonal. While they're not the same thing, they're not orthogonal. They're not orthogonal because there is a limit case when influence goes to 100, where the two are the same, right? But we rarely live in that world. So as long as we don't live in a world where influence equals to brainwashing, then, then network centralization and decision right centralization will not be the same. They will be different. Hangjun? Yeah, hi, Vanish. Um, I was just wondering if we imply, so between the two decision rights and the, you know, the network, um, so to me, it's more like uh, the decision right is more for uh, it's given by the former structure, yep. whereas the network centralization is more like an emerging from the kind of informal interactions between leaders. Do we imply that? I think that's a reasonable interpretation, but remember implicitly they are different only if the informal structure does not produce weights equal to 100%. Right? If they did, then the two become equivalent. So when we say the informal structure is network centralization, formal structure is decision centralization, what we are not saying, but we are implying is that the informal structure influence weights are not going to reach 100, right? But once we take that into account, yeah, absolutely, no problem. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is the reason why even though those two things appear in different rows of the table, in reality, I think they're actually kind of related. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the question of symmetric versus asymmetric. So I started with a simple example of a simple organization with two actors, right? So it's an asymmetric tie here. And you can see that the network centralization of this organization is very high because the degree of A is 1 and the degree of B is 0. It's asymmetric. Therefore, this is a highly centralized network. At the same time, the decision rights could be either decentralized where both will vote or A decides for both. But in the limit case where the weight of A on B is equivalent to brainwashing, the two are the same, right? I'm just repeating what I just said, but with an example of two actors instead of many actors, just to make the point that these are really uh, driven by the same thing. Okay, let's talk about machine learning. So by now, I think you guys have seen some version of this picture across multiple courses. So hopefully this is not new for you, right? But a very, very quick refresher. AI is the umbrella construct. It's about intelligent behavior, which is not biological. What is intelligent behavior? Intelligent behavior is behavior that shows adaptation to task environments, okay? Uh, what is non-biological intelligent behavior? Essentially things that humans have designed. So far, that's the ones we know. Uh, within that, there is machine learning, which is a particular kind of AI. The big difference between old AI and machine learning, uh, the best way to express that is the analogy of teaching a child how to do long division, how do you teach a child how to do long division? You tell them the rules. You say, put the number here, put the divisor here, multiply this, take the reminder and so on. Versus teaching a child how to ride a bicycle. Okay, so there are no rules for riding a bicycle. You've got to give them training data, which is their experiences. And effectively through a series of reinforcement learning processes, they figure it out, right? So they make prediction errors, they learn from that, they get better. So machine learning is the new incarnation of AI. It's the most powerful one today. And is the one that's really causing a lot of the commercial excitement around the applications. 
Within that, there are these three big buckets, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. We've been talking so far in this class entirely about the third bucket, which is reinforcement learning, right? Maximizing rewards by taking actions over repeated periods of time. But what we want to do today is understand how that relates to supervised learning and unsupervised learning, right? Because clearly this is very important as well. So where in our framework of thinking about org learning would we put supervised and unsupervised learning? So far, we haven't really talked about them. We mostly talked about reinforcement learning. So where do those two forms of learning fit into our schema of thinking about org learning? Any ideas? Are we familiar with these terms first, just to make sure that I'm not assuming things that I shouldn't assume. Um, everybody knows like what supervised learning is and what unsupervised learning is and so on. Yeah, okay. So in that case, then you should see the link to the notions of online versus offline learning. Okay, so reinforcement learning is online learning. So experience arises from direct interaction with the environment. And this is what we've been focusing on, learning by doing, learning from experience, trial and error learning. Offline learning requires no direct interaction with the environment, okay? So things like vicarious learning, knowledge transfer, prototyping, simulation, where the agents are not acting directly on the task environment. These are all forms of offline learning, okay? And supervised and unsupervised learning can be thought of as forms of offline learning, all right? Now, let me make that a bit more concrete. So think about, what is the core problem in each of these kinds of learning? What's the actual math behind what each one is doing? So in reinforcement learning, the core problem is adaptation. So if I do X1, I get outcome F1. If I do X2, I get outcome F2. If I do X2 again, sometimes I get an outcome F3. If I do X4, I get F4. So the question I'm trying to answer is what should I do? Right, that's the problem. So what action should I take in order to get the reward that maximizes my cumulative rewards? That's the reinforcement learning problem. In the case of supervised learning, the core problem we are solving is forecasting. So we have the data already. The environment has provided us the data. We don't have to take any further actions. And in the data, I see that if you do X1, you get Y1. And you don't even have to do. If X1 happens, Y1 seems to happen. X2 happens, Y2 happens. So the question is, what will happen when Xn happens? That's a forecasting problem, right? That's supervised learning. And unsupervised learning is a problem of categorization. So X1 and X2 seem to belong together. X3 and X4 belong together. I have a new observation, Xn. Should it go to A or should it go to B, right? That's the unsupervised learning problem. How do I categorize these things into clusters, okay? But the key difference between these from an org learning perspective is that it's only the reinforcement learning, the adaptation one that occurs online. Okay. Whereas both supervised and unsupervised learning can take place without actors directly taking actions on the task environment. In plain terms, we usually work with archival data for both supervised and unsupervised learning. Whereas with reinforcement learning, the actor would have to interact in real time with their task environment to be able to produce certain feedback signals, which then they could learn from. Right. So that's basically the link, if you like, between how we think about Odd learning, which is mostly driven by reinforcement learning, and vicarious learning, which has elements of offline learning, which might also be thought of in terms of unsupervised, supervised learning models that we see in this context. Okay. Now, within supervised learning, there is a particular trade off, which again, I suspect you know, but I want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with this idea. Um, let's take a very simple prediction problem. I'm trying to predict a continuous variable y as a function of x. Okay. If you were testing a hypothesis about the relationship between y and x, what would we do? How would we test the hypothesis? Suppose you have a theory which says, I think when x goes up, y goes up. I have the scatter plot, okay, but that's not a hypothesis test. How would I convert this into a hypothesis test? You do regression. Okay, so I can fit a linear regression and I can test whether the slope of the coefficient is positive, right? And that can be my hypothesis test. Okay, 
Now, suppose I don't care about testing the hypothesis. What I want to do is actually build a model that for any given value of X tells me a value of Y. Different problem, right? I'm no longer interested in testing any theory or hypothesis about whether X goes up, Y goes up. I just am solving the naive engineering problem of <clears throat> I have data on past X and Y's. You give me a new value of X. I want you to tell me what's the value of Y. What would I do now? Just link every dot, every dots. Sorry? Just link every dots, like draw a line. Function that cuts everything, yeah. But even before we go that far, to begin with, I would do exactly the same thing, right? My first answer is the same. I would start with the linear regression. Okay, so the very first thing, you're absolutely right. I mean, so we'll go, go towards where you're going in a, in a second. But the first point I just want to make sure everybody understands is a linear regression model can be used both for hypothesis testing and for prediction. Right? The model is a prediction because if I have the line and now you tell me a value of X that's not in my data, let's say there's a value of X here, I can look it up and tell you what the value of Y is. So it's a prediction, right? That's why introductory machine learning classes, the first few weeks is all about linear regression. Okay, so linear regression is a tool that can be used just as well for machine learning as it can be used for hypothesis testing. But of course, our linear model is not going to fit the data very well, which is exactly why we need a more curvy kind of function, right? So this is like a more, a better fitting function. Maybe another one which goes through every point would look something like this, right? So what machine learning is really doing is just doing this. The more advanced versions of machine learning and the deep learning algorithms are currently the most advanced ones they can really fit models that look this nonlinear, okay? And that, as you can immediately see, gives rise to two problems. What's the first problem? I can no longer explain it in English, okay? When it was a line, I can explain it easily in English. I can say when X goes up, Y goes up. But what am I going to say now? When X goes up a little bit, Y goes up, but then start Y starts going down, and then again it goes up, and then... So you can no longer explain it in English, right? And this is when there's one independent variable. Imagine if there were 20, okay? And this is not a curve, but a hyper curve, which is in a hyper space of 20 plus one dimensions. So when people say deep learning is black box and mysterious and hard to understand, there's nothing like magical going on. It's just that it's very hard to explain in English, a complex polynomial in a hyperspace. Because there's no intuition, right? I cannot tell you anything intuitive about what's going on. I can just say this is the function. So the first problem is there is a trade-off between prediction accuracy and explainability. Okay? You cannot fight this. It's just the nature of the physics of the problem. So the better you get at prediction, the worse you will get at explanation. Full stop. There is no way to escape this, right? So everything we do to improve explainability of AI comes at the cost of prediction accuracy. Second problem. I'll let you tell me what the second problem is because we spend a lot of time on the second problem in research design, research methods. So what's the so, second problem of fitting a model that looks this nonlinear on this data? Overfitting. Overfitting, very good. I'm glad you remember, right? So overfitting. Now, why is that a problem? Because the data you are observing here is always a combination of some portion of the truth plus noise. Right? All data is a sample. A sample is drawn from a population. A sample is a combination of the truth in the population plus sampling error, noise. So when I fit a model that fits my data this closely, the risk is I'm not just fitting the truth, I'm fitting the noise. And the problem with that, of course, is when I'm trying to generalize out of sample, I'm going to make a mess, right? Because this super complicated model is going to make lots of predictions which will not hold out in new data because it's really capturing noise, not the underlying truth. So effectively, all of machine learning today is really just trying to solve these two problems, right? How do you solve the problem of avoiding overfitting while increasing predictive accuracy through nonlinearity? That's really the core of what machine learning algorithms do. And when it comes to application, how do you improve the predictive accuracy without giving up so much on explainability that people start getting nervous about using it? That's the usage side of the problem. Right? So on the user side, that's what the machine learning problem is. On the statistical side, the basic problem is how do I increase nonlinearity to improve fit, but not to such a degree that I overfit the data. Okay? And that, that second statistical problem is exactly what is called the bias variance trade-off. Right? 
So if you have this data, I think you've seen this before in research methods. So this is just a quick refresher. So you want ideally a model that is not so nonlinear that it overfits, but also not so less nonlinear that it underfits. And the way we want to find this optimal model complexity is solving what is called the bias variance trade-off. Right? The bias here is if your model is underfitting, variance is if it is overfitting, because effectively then it will make a lot of noisy predictions out of sample. Okay. So this to me is like one of the major insights of machine learning, which translate beyond machine learning to life in general. The other one was exploration exploitation, right? That we've already discussed in some depth. So if you had to explain the key philosophy or the key wisdom of exploration exploitation to somebody who doesn't know anything about reinforcement learning or bandits or organizational learning, how would you explain it? You have your 15 year old nephew who comes and asks you, uncle, what do I do in life? And what can you tell me about this thing called exploration exploitation? How do you explain it to them? Try something new, try something different from what you're doing now. Yeah. So often the way I do it, I mean, I don't have 15 year old nephews and nieces anymore. They are already older, but I do have to explain it to business people who don't necessarily have a background in, in any of these topics. And the way I explain it to them is similar to what Nettie said. I tell them it's not crazy to throw some money at crazy ideas, right? And I'm very careful in my choice of words. So it's not crazy to throw some money. I'm not saying a lot. And if they ask me how much is some, then I run away very fast because nobody knows. We don't know what the optimal exploration is, right? But it's not crazy to throw some money at crazy ideas. And crazy is precisely defined as things that don't appear to be the first best given your current belief structure, right? That's the exploration exploitation insight. In the same way, what would be the advice for your 15 year old nephew based on the bias variance trade off? Don't, don't follow advice. Sorry, Nati, go on. As similar, just don't follow exactly what other people are doing. In general, if you think about your data set here as experience, okay, that can be your own life experience, it can be other people's life experience vicariously. So you want to learn from those experiences, but you don't want to be captured by them. You don't want to overlearn, right? The reason is your experience is a sample, and a sample is always a combination of truth plus noise. So if you overlearn from your experience, you are going to be ending up overfitting, right? So this is really a very powerful point. And if you understand overfitting and the problem of generalization, then you understand, for instance, why p-hacking is a problem. So why is p-hacking a problem? There are actually two very different reasons. One reason is ethical. The other is statistical. Actually, the ethical reason is not the big one. The big one is a statistical problem. What's the ethical problem? The ethical problem is you run the analysis, find a low p-value, and then write the hypothesis. So in effect, you're pretending to be smarter than you are. You're claiming that I already knew this, but actually you didn't, you made it up later. That's an ethical problem. But the real problem is a statistical one, because what you found could be overfitting, which means it's not going to replicate. It won't generalize, right? So even if you're okay with people overclaiming their smartness and we are willing to you know, kind of deinflate that for every claim they make by putting a correction factor, we can't get around the point that with p-hacking, you're going to get a volume of results which don't replicate. Okay, That's also driven exactly by this phenomenon. The problem of overgeneralizing or superstitious learning is also picked up in this picture. Right? One form of superstitious learning is in this picture, where I look at my life experience and I say, this is what I'm going to do. But you see, my life experience is a sample. Some of it is true, some is noise. And if I overfit it, I'm not going to be making the right decision. Okay. So these are, again, I think, very general principles, which are captured very precisely in these theorems in machine learning, but have, I think, quite broad applicability uh, in, in learning in general. All right, so let me pause there and see any questions about either of these things. So I've gone through this overview of, of the three families of machine learning super fast. My assumption being that you guys now are kind of familiar with these techniques, may have even used them in some of your work already. But uh, if, if something is not